Welcome everybody to the big show. Today we're going to talk about leadership. And Christian and I have a pretty fun conversation about what it means and how most people assume leadership and that is not even close to what it is. It's a, it's a misunderstood idea or theory in a, in a sense. Um, and we get to talk about uh, some customer service that Christian experienced that he is somehow paralleling to a technician inspection and a service advisor. <laughs> I totally did. <laughs> <laughs> and much, much more coming up on this edition of Service Drive Revolution. <laughs> Did uh, chest and arms today. Yeah. And I felt so pumped at the end. Uh, I sent Adder, my trainer, a uh, text when I was getting ready this morning. I'm like, I feel like I should just walk around with my shirt off all day. I'm pumped. And I said, how long will it last? And do you know what he said? Half a day. And he goes, then you work out again. Yeah. So he's like, you want to come to lunch and work out again? And that's why he looks the way he does. Because he works out twice a day. He's a special human being. It's crazy. He's a big boy. He is. But uh, none of it accidental. Like you said, he's putting in the work. Oh, yeah. That that boy can eat. Sometimes I catch myself whenever we're eating together. I just watch him and I don't eat. Like, it's just, he just, uh, his consumption is... It's borderline gluttonous. My, fa- my favorite story is when we invited him to, uh, what's that steakhouse over here? Mastro's. Mastro's. And he ordered like the porterhouse or whatever. And yeah, some sort like, of bone-in, four-pound steak. Baked potato. Like, w- we had a salad. Yep. Were there appetizers? Yep. And then he's eating his steak. And I think I'm probably done with my steak because I had like a 10-ounce and he's got like 24 ounces yeah. or something. And he stops the waitress and he goes, can I get another basket of bread? Not a piece of bread. No, a basket. Not a bread stick. And then he proceeded to eat that. Then he had cheesecake. Yeah. And everyone at the table was just watching. Yeah. It was it was unlike any kind of thing. Yeah. It's what I expect the Nathan's Hot Dog uh, Challenge is like watching. Where people just keep putting food places and you don't know how it happens. Right. It's fascinating. No, there were times, I think, where he's trying to eat 12,000 calories in a day. That's not easy to do. That looked like an 8,000-calorie meal. So yeah, he had to have gotten close. That's one thing about eating a lot of protein is that packs some calories in them. Like a, the those bars that I love, those barbell ones, those are 200 calories a shot. They are? Yeah. So you, so you shouldn't eat five of them? No, but I could. Um, but yeah. Yeah, they're kind of addictive. Did I tell you I went to the dentist the other day? Because of all your candy bars. <laughs> right. So I'm sure that had something to do with it. But um, but I haven't gone to the dentist in way, way too long. So I kind of just had this feeling of like, you know when it's time. And uh, so I did the thing. And I'm also Do you like, have a dentist? No. So well, how do you how do you you didn't ask Missy? You just figured it out? Yeah. So I started with asking, which is funny because I've been paying for dental insurance for a while now. And I had to ask Patricia, like what's her dental insurance so she gave me the here's who it is and all that other stuff and i went on the website and i programmed everything in and it's like type in your zip code and it just gave me a couple of options so i i only picked so you, this so you found your dentist on craigslist yeah so i basically find that yeah the the whole thing is going to come full circle so stick with me on this but so i go through and i basically do a zip code finder on a dentist when you live in downtown los angeles that's not the best way to find a dentist so you know um, so I go on and then I make the appointment and then, um, and then, uh, I get all the stuff confirmed over text message, which I actually kind of really liked, but, uh, they sent me all the registration, like the pre forms. It's like, Hey, your appointments at nine o'clock on Saturday. And if you, uh, if you do the registration form, you'll get in really, really fast is what the promise was. Right. So my appointment so is it's at, like you, you're going to get the, the, uh, TSA pre speed line. Yep. So Point was at nine. I got there at eight fifty. Um, I would have gotten there earlier, but it's all right. It's a different story. Do you so, brush your teeth right before you go? Always and mouthwash. I, I brush floss, mouthwash right before I go because I don't want 
a janky mouth when somebody's looking in there. And then you don't drink coffee? I don't drink coffee till afterwards. Exactly right. Mm. So that's how the morning was. And then, um, so I get in there, uh, 8.50 for my 9 o'clock appointment. Want to take a stab on when I went into the, got called back. What time it was? Is it worse than 10? It was exactly 10. Good. You, so an hour? You played this game before. So an hour. Then they pull me in, and that's when I met, like... Wait, what, so what's what's the place? Wh- where are we at? Like Sixth Street. Okay, so it's a building that you're like, I never want, I never wondered what was in there, but... Yeah. It's a medical building, and there's dental offices yes, in there. Yes, and the outside is a What was the waiting room like? Um, clean. What kind of magazines? I don't know. I didn't look at them. So not very good then. Right. So I think highlights, kid magazines. I so you're just on highlights. your phone the whole time, or what are you doing for an hour? No, I talked to Claudia was with me, so we talked the whole time. She but, held your hand? No, she just wanted to go with. But she Why? didn't hold my hand. I don't know. It's our weekend time together, I guess. But to her, she'd rather hang out with me at the dentist's office for an hour than be by herself. Okay. So, um. So, so we, you're talking to her for an hour in yep. the in this waiting room. Yeah, just observing. She's, she's, when was this building built? When's the last time this office was remodeled? Oh, I'd say with, it's the office is remodeled within five years. Way better oh. on the inside than the outside. Okay. Um, so so pretty, pretty nice. Yeah. So she's telling me for the first 20 minutes how terrible of a decision I've made about choosing the dentist. And why would you ever choose a dentist based on zip code? Probably good advice. And you should ask Missy. I should have asked Missy. Patricia actually also made a recommendation of her dentist with it. She loves. I didn't listen to any of that. Didn't do any of the logical things. But so I go back, and then the first step is X-rays, and that's when I meet the. Uh, I would say that he was probably the hygienist, but very polite guy, and he's like, "Hey, I'm. I don't remember what his name was, but uh, he's like, I'm going to take you through. We're going to do X-rays first, and then I'm going to transfer you to another room where your exam is going to happen." And I thought that was pretty nice. So he does all the things, bite me down. He's asking me, you know, hey, is this your first time here? All that other stuff, which I thought was kind of cool. And then we go into the exam They don't room. know it's your first time there? He didn't know. The records don't show yeah, that? Yeah, it should have shown. But it also is kind of funny because I know that they knew because I got a peek at their schedule, which I thought was really kind of smart. So every time, and uh, totally HIPAA violations, but um, I could see every name of all the people that had scheduled appointments for the day, like the whole schedule was up, and I thought it was pretty smart. So every time they did a new patient appointment, they blocked out the two hours afterwards, which was pretty crafty. So why do you think they did that? Upsells. For upsells. Because so you need a water pump in your mouth. You need a water <laughs> pump. Water you need a, like you need a new dry felt. Exactly. You need an alignment. <laughs> so, um, so we're sitting there kind of shooting fitting the breeze, you for everything Invisalign. like that. And the first, the first question that I asked him after we kind of got to know each other a little bit, I'm like, hey, level with me. How many times has this place gotten broken into? Well, twice that I know of. I'm like, it's so probably four times. Because it's in that, like, it's in that area um, where you can see. It doesn't matter how nice it is on the inside. The outside is it's rough. So, um, so then the doctor, co- the dentist comes in. Hi, I'm Dr. Tiffany. I'm going to be doing your inspection. Is Tiffany a, a guy or a girl? Girl. Girl. Oh. So, um, she gets Where'd right. Where did Tiffany go to school? Didn't, she didn't want to talk. Oh. She just did the. M- table sign, man. Yeah. She's a, uh, she, she'd be a good advisor. Yeah. So she's there to do the MPI. She was the technician. The yeah. hygienist was the advisor. So she goes through, and I thought it was super interesting. Other than saying, hi, I'm Dr. Tiffany. I'm going to do your inspection. She didn't really talk to me anymore. She just went through the uh, advisor guy. So she's talking to him while she's doing the MPI on my mouth and just talking to him in code. What are they doing, like measuring your gums or something? Yeah. So uh, That's always an interesting thing where they're like, two, four, and then it's like... One, <laughs> right? And you're like, what does that mean? <laughs> Where it's a deviation, but she's like, she's throwing out things like ortho consult, uh, crown seven. Like you can just hear all the things that you she's need saying, a crown? right? It's a it's a cosmetic crown, if anything. So uh, one of my teeth on the side is smaller, and there's there's more gaps than there should be. But the truth is, I've got other. Do tacos get stuck in there? Yeah. So I floss. On Do a you lie basis. about how long uh, how often you floss? No. No. She didn't even ask. I feel like they know. Like if your gums. I feel like we could get you to a better dentist. I will do a better de- better dentist. I just needed to get this thing out of the way, right? Or I needed did it to hurt? get. Um, where I don't want to say hurt, but I felt dirty 
you ever feel like your teeth are dirty, you probably go to the dentist more often than I do. But like now that I'm back, I'll go every six months like I always did because I'm all about preventative maintenance, right? At the end of the day. So so she does the whole inspection and then the hygienist is like, hey, so someone's going to be back and they're going to go over your results with you, which I thought was pretty interesting. So, so then, what time is it now? Uh, I wrote it on my card. So after inspection was done. It's funny that you think about your teeth as a car. Yeah, so it was uh, 1020 when Dr. Tiffany started, and then 1045 is when somebody came in for the MPI presentation. Okay, and how was that? Uh, not too bad. I thought it was Did pretty... Did they do table of contents? Yes. And also insurance benefit. Like, hey, if you had to pay for this out of pocket, uh, it would be this, but with your insurance savings, it's only this. How I much did your really, insurance pay for? Uh, if I'd done the crown and everything, it would have been um, they would have paid a thousand. I paid five hundred. I would have paid five hundred. Um, I elected not to do the crown. Is the five hundred the deductible? No, it's the deductible's fifty on that insurance. But uh, but I really liked how how she presented it. So I'm like, I did everything except for the crown, and she immediately went into a price objection, right? Oh, Which was well, what? Well, I understand in a lot of Did our... you say it was the price or no, you just were like I don't I just said no, I don't want the crown, I want everything else. And so she goes into this thing, she's like I just want to let you know, we've got financing available and you can do this thing where you take it out over 12 months and a lot of my customers like to do it that way. Oh, wow. I thought that was really really good and I just said, "Hey, I just can be honest with you, it's not about the price." <laughs> and I said, "I'm not going to do it just because my thought was is I'm going to find the dentist that I really want to do and then I'll do like cuz I want to do I probably want to do like I'm not uh, opposed to any ortho work or anything like that because I want my grill to look nice as I get older. But um, your what to look nice? My grill. <laughs> Thought you said my girl to look nice. No, my grill. Your grill. But um, but I probably will do all that stuff on the on the next go around. But I love that she presented me options because of the no, and I'm gonna guess that just based on where I was at, that the financing probably the price probably is a big objection in a lot of play in a lot of situation so i like that and then i said no i want to do this and i'm like great we're gonna get it started right away so i thought that was interesting it um the mpi presentation happened at 10 45 they came in for the upsell work and she started at 11 15 was it tiffany yeah it was dr tiffany again did she have better bedside no, manner she after? still didn't talk to me really yeah the only thing i said after she was done i was like wow that's pretty fast she's like yeah this machine works good and then she was off to the next office Wow. Yeah. So Dr. Yeah. Tiffany doesn't have really good bedtime manner, but she was pretty efficient with what she had to do. Okay. Next time you're at the dentist, the first thing you need to ask is what school they went to. And then just be like, oh. And just say, like, oh. no matter what it is. Like, if they say I went to Stanford, oh. just be like, oh. I'm from the East Coast. <laughs> That's funny. But I thought that there was a lot of like the one thing that I thought was great about that that we can learn from a service department perspective is one is I thought that the hygienist did a great job of petting the dog. Um, two is the MPI presentation was really, really organized and it was ta it was one price, which I really liked. And then the fact that they scheduled themselves knowing that so new new patients must be their bread and butter. They got a system. Yes. So they had a system. There was nothing that was scaled out. And then really interesting to me was that um they had me blocked off from 9 to 12, and I was done by 11.50. So I really liked that part of it. So, um, But the fact that it was in a terrible, terrible thing. It reminded me of like a no-win situation. So uh, I don't know if you've ever – I've ever told you the story before or not. <laughs> but, uh, but there was this uh, – It reminds you of a no-win situation. <laughs> yeah. So there was this, uh, <laughs> there's this airplane and it had only, it was a small airplane. So it had five passengers on it and there was, there was some sort of catastrophic failure happening in the plane and the pilot looks back and he says, Hey, um, the plane's going down. Um, I'm going to do everything I can to keep it steady. And I just want you guys all to, to kind of give out. And there's five of you. Um, and there's only four parachutes. And uh, I forgot the best part is who's in this airplane. So the first is the president of the United States. The second is a lawyer. Um, the third person, a young girl. The fourth, a priest. And then the fifth is just a little altar boy. So... 
<laughs> Wait, okay. So, and then the pilot is six. The pilot's six, but the pilot has agreed he's going down with the ship. Oh. So he doesn't have a plan on getting out of the plane. Okay. So no he, win situation. No win situation. So, and there's four parachutes out of the five people. So first one to grab the parachute, the president. I'm in charge of the free world. I got to live. Grabs a parachute, runs out. Second one, lawyer, of course, right? Grabs second. I help other people. The world wouldn't exist without lawyers. Grabs the parachute, hops out. Third, the girl. She looks, uh, looks around and says, I'm way cuter than you guys. Grabs bag, hops out. So it's just the priest and the little boy. So the priest looks at the little boy and says, you've got a lot of life left to live. I want you to take the, the parachute, the last parachute. Little boy looks at the priest and says, oh, no, we can both take parachutes because that little blonde girl, she grabbed my backpack. That is not what I thought was going to happen. <laughs> I took you on a little ride there, didn't I? <laughs> I was so nervous when you said yeah. altar boy. <laughs> oh, it's great. Oh. Yeah. Pretty good. I like it. Thank you. What should we talk about today? Leadership. So, uh, you know, but I don't know that everybody knows. I've been working on this book. For a little while. And it, it, the book turned into two books. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never forget the day you told me it was going to be two books. <laughs> what was that day? It was, uh, it was, I'm almost done. It, you didn't even say I was going into two books. What you told me was, you said, instead of, I, I think I asked you, I'm like, how's the book coming? And you said, I'm almost done with book one. And I'm like, what? Oh, yeah. Because, but I'm almost stuck with done with book one implies that there was There's a book two. two, but you didn't tell me it was two books until that moment. And I thought that was so interesting. You're like, yeah, so, so book one is this and book two is, is this, which made perfect sense once you explained it. But now in hindsight, like I couldn't imagine you could have done this any other way and it be as effective as it is. But you wrote two books in one book. And it's, well, uh, each book is specific to a different thing, right? Yeah, but you, uh, but the way that you couldn't do one without the other, I don't right? Think. But I don't think most. So that's kind of what I wanted to talk about today. Is I don't think most people look at leadership in that sense, right? Like, so I was trying to uh, kind of like do an inventory in my head of how many leadership seminars, workshops, classes, books I've been to. And I don't know, in here I think we have somewhere close to 500 books that would land in leadership kind of one way or the other. There's, you know, there's a, would books on Napoleon be in leadership? Yeah. Yeah. Some of the war books we have, right? So it's it's hard to quantify exactly, but there's there's quite a few. And I've been a, a fan of leadership. I've also always been very observant of human behavior. Like, I feel like, do you ever feel like I see things different than most people? Always. Do you ever wonder why? Um, I don't know if I wonder why, just I accept that you do. Like, I know that how I perceive something, and then when I ask you about it, I'm going to get a completely different perspective. I don't know if I ever wondered why. I wonder, I wonder why, and I'll tell you how that happens, is uh, sometimes when I say things to people, it seems like to me the most common sense, easy solution. Like, I'm assuming that somebody wants the answer they're asking me for the answer or we're talking about something and they're clearly seeking an answer for a certain thing then i give them the answer and then their surprise and uh resistance to the answer always catches me off guard yes you've named it what do you mean you've named that whole experience it's a thing yeah but it does make me feel different. 
Like I, cause it's not in the moment. I'm very engaged in the idea of helping them get, I, I feel like we're on, we're on the same page and then all of a sudden we're not. And it surprises me when we're not because everything going up to that point felt natural. Yeah. Like you're arm in arm. Yeah. And then all of a sudden they go right, you go left. But yeah. they tell you they want to go left, but they go right. If that makes sense. And so clearly there's something about me that's different. Like I've had a different experience in life that gets me to a point where I'm, I'm seeing things in a different way. Right. Yeah. And so, um, I can remember at a very early age coming to the conclusion that the adults would say one narrative that was a popular narrative and everybody agreed on that narrative, but it, the truth was something completely different. And just an abstract example, that would be my stepfather would say that you can't, you know, listen to secular music or watch secular movies or, you know, watch TV. You shouldn't have sex before marriage, like all of these narratives about things. But then he leaves my mom for a 21 year old girl that he's not married to and he's having sex with her. And it's like, well, wait, you said this was really important. Like this was, I'm going to go to hell if I don't do this. And now you've completely jumped off the ship. And not only are you not married to her, you're cheat. Like, and I, I never really believed you over here. You seemed miserable when you were saying it, but now it's like, yeah. And it felt like the adults were very inconsistent in it was, uh, do as I say, not as I do. And you, if you're paying attention, you can see those incongruencies in, in people, right? Yeah, for sure. Did you ever feel that way when you were a kid? Yes. And how did you, how did you process it? Well, I, I remember my upbringing was if I called out the inconsistency, it was, I don't care. I'm in charge. Do what I say, not what I do. Yeah. But like, how did you process that? Um, that because they were in charge, they could do it. I just accepted that that was the inconsistency was a part of adulthood. Yeah. And so there's that narrative that all the adults agree on. So if my stepfather was around a group of people, they would all agree that you shouldn't leave your wife for a 21 year old girl. And they would all agree on that. But then what you do is something different. Yeah. Super confusing. Yeah. And that seemed like a pattern throughout, like, you know, my father left my mom when I was two months old. Like it, it never seemed like the, the parents, I mean, that's why my generation is what it is or whatever, is I was the first generation where the parents prioritized themselves over the kids. Nobody was staying together for the kids anymore. That game was over. And so, you know, I don't know. My mom was married twice. I'd, I'd experienced two divorces before I was 13. And so a lot of what people would say and then what was reality, it just made me question things because what was true seemed to be disguised in a bunch of rules and uh formalities and guilt and consensus and agreeing with everybody but that all was a was a distraction from what really is true in the moment right um and so when it comes to leadership training and I think about like all of the leadership training I have been to in a sense and what most leadership training is about, it seems like that also in that most of what is taught is about the, the symptoms of leadership or the, the external side of it, but nobody's really talking about the fact that that's management. Most yeah. leadership training out there is management training. And that makes sense because it kind of goes along with all the stuff that you're saying because the stuff that I think drives management teachings 
or the the main thing, which is the same thing that was driving you and all the things you noticed was compliance, like a human's need for compliance. And I think that the key to management is getting compliance. It's not about inspiring. It's about getting compliance. And then if I think back to you as a kid, what you recognized is that the compliance had inconsistency. And the only reason you would do that is because you were told you had to, not because it made any sense. So the thing that I think is special about the way that you look thing, look at things is you're going for the stuff that makes sense and the truth as opposed to what we're told we have to believe. So the compliance is a big thing there. And, and I, I, would, I would kind of say, and this is uh, something that we kind of uh, share in our, in our view of things is um, the results. Right. Everything else doesn't matter for the most part. It's how you get there, how do you get to the results? Yeah. And so most of most of what we talk about is management training. It's not leadership training. And then really if you if you uh are honest about it, I don't know, one in a million people are a leader. If that probably like there, less than that. You you could uh you could turn the fire sprinklers on in downtown Los Angeles and you might not get a leader wet. Like it's um it's very rare like you know just take general electric for example you had jack welsh but everybody before and after that was a manager and they're the ceo and i mean i know a lot of people that are ceos i know a lot of people that are entrepreneurs or car dealers or whatever very rarely in my, in my journey have i met a real leader and um the true leaders that I have met are hard to recognize because they're quiet. Oh, that's an interesting connection. They're not the, the, the loudest, uh, you know, they don't, they, they usually don't have to be, you know, they don't have to have the attention or control the, you know, they don't, uh, they don't need that. And for the most part, people that we would mistake as being leaders really are, it's about power. It's about ego. It's about, you know, their way. It's not, it's not leadership in a sense. Right. It's management more than anything else. Right. And so in, in creating the book, that you kind of got you got two two sides to this, right? One is the human. Like the before you can be a leader, there's some certain there's there's an inventory and a, a sort of um, there's sort of a list of things you got to work out before people are going to follow you at all, for the most part. Be, yeah, before you can even bluff that. Like yeah. you can't, it's, it starts internally and then it's external. Right. So for example, one thing that I've noticed is I'm not very good. Well, uh, we've talked about this before. Whenever I used to go into the service departments and, uh, interview everybody, the manager, dealer, general manager would always come to me and say, uh, who do you think is going to make it? And, and in, in the beginning, I would tell them what I thought. You're and then I very wrong. quickly realized that the, the, the interview that I was performing was in an old system with a culture that was broken. And really, I couldn't, I couldn't judge people until they were in a good system with a good culture. And then I knew what I had. But most of the time, I didn't know what I had yet because the water was poisoned. Right. And so I learned very quickly that I would just have no idea. Like, that isn't how I, how I do it. I just put the systems in place, and then people are going to surprise you. I know that. I know people are going to surprise you, but I don't know exactly who it is. But I couldn't judge who was going to be a winner or a loser by just talking to them any more than... Uh, our win loss ratio of interviewing people to hire them without knowing their background and their past performance. It's a guess if anything. Right. And, and so it's the same thing with leadership in the sense that you can't look at somebody 
and say that person is a leader because that isn't where you judge leadership. Where you judge leadership is in the behavior of followers. So you got to turn around and look at the followers and assess their effectiveness, their commitment level, you know, what the story they're telling. And then, and only then, you can really understand if the person is a leader or not. But it's not, you know, it's not an individual sport. So you can't do it just by looking at the person. I start the book off with a story about Heaven's Gate. And I, I kind of explained that if I met that guy, so Heaven's Gate was a cult and he got a bunch of people to kill themselves. It's a famous Nike Cortez. They were all in uniforms plastic bags over their head and they just in case the Kool-Aid catch didn't a, work. Yeah. Catch a uh comet to something. I don't know. Earth was being recycled. Yeah. And so they were getting off. And they all got off at the same time. And if you met that guy at a party and you're like, hey, what do you do? Would you guess that he could get people to uh answer the phone? Never. Right. Meanwhile, he tells you like, hey, I got 35 people back at the house that uh, in a week are going to kill themselves for a crazy idea that I had. You, you would say excited. there's no way. Yeah. Right. Like there's absolutely no way that anybody would follow this guy. So you got to turn around and look at the followers to really understand because that guy looks like a kook. Yeah. Just the way he looked, the way he talked, everything about him was uh, was not giving the impression of him creating followership in others, right? And yet. He did. And not to a, not to a very positive to outcome. To the extreme way. Yeah. And so my conclusion kind of with this is that leadership training that exists currently is mostly about the symptom in management training and what we are going to try to do in the marketplace is we're going to try to show people what real leadership is. And I would probably contend that a lot of people are going to decide it's not for them. That a lot of people are more comfortable just being a manager because being a leader is completely different. It's a bigger sacrifice, way bigger sacrifice. Yeah. And a way bigger game. It's just a bigger game. The upside is, is that you get to a different level of potential with this thing and bringing other people like I, it's so selfless at the end of the day, but there's a, there's a lot of gratification in it too. But I do think that uh, there's a world where the people that it's not for, yeah, that's true. But the people that what we're doing that are that are four are going to become more influential, more effective, better results than they ever dreamed were possible. So he didn't need three million people to join the cult, right? So it wasn't a volume game. Yeah, and kind of scary too. Like, well, yeah, the the level of compliance plus plus my favorite thing about that, and I think you were the one that pointed this out, that particular thing is is that do not think anyone based on your intelligent level, intelligence level or your social status, you're not immune to really good leadership or people that are super uh able to create followership if you will. Like, we go into that in pretty pretty d big detail in book 2. Yeah, so and one of the examples the, is uh, Germany. And that, that we could talk about that for days. Yeah, but there was a gap. And uh, the guy with the funny mustache stepped into the gap. But yeah. there, was a, there was a huge void there that he stepped into because the morale was so low. Like, oh, yeah. he it was hope. a perfect storm. Yep, a lot of things. But same sort of thing, like creating followership doesn't really, at the end of the day, have a code of ethics. Like, I wish it did. Well, mo you know, I've told you this before. Most of all of the training that I've done in human behavior and that sort of thing 
is based out of wanting to protect myself, wanting to not hire the wrong people, wanting to not get taken advantage of, wanting to be able to tell when I'm in danger or I'm not. It wasn't about uh, leading other people. That that rarely is the uh, the motivation for me. The motivation for me is protecting myself, which is odd, I know, but. I remember having that discussion with you very similar. Do you remember uh, talking about hypnosis? And I think it's fascinating that you can do that to someone else. And you're like, I never want to hypnotize anybody. I just want to understand what, what's happening. Yeah. It's the same thing. You're just trying to educate yourself a little bit for protection. I understand that now. Yeah. But the funny thing about hypnosis is um, now I think – now I understand – it and it's a it's a more common thing than everybody thinks yeah it's probably just happening more at the micro hypnosis level than like a stage where you're putting somebody under it's compliance authority but most yeah. people are hypnotized most people do what you tell them to do if you just say it with conviction it's funny how that works yeah it it, it is funny how that works but 90 percent of people are uh on automatic you, pilot. It's ingrained in us. We want to comply. Yeah. It's sa- it feels safe. And I guess that's that's been my problem my whole life is I don't I don't crave that safety. I don't feel safe when I'm complying because everybody that's told me to comply in the end has let me down maybe, I don't know. Yeah. But that math doesn't add up to me. I'm a little well, I mean, you were saying it earlier that a lot of people think that I'm pro-Trump. Oh, yeah. It's interesting to me. But what they don't get is that Trump's a better marketer, right? Like, the right next to the MAGA hat here in the presidential part of the library. So we, if you haven't been to the library, which most of you haven't, in the, in the hall, we have kind of display cases of presidential books so there's like yeah, a lot of memorabilia there's a some really cool stuff there's a signed jfk book from his inauguration yeah. there's a ron there's there's a couple ronald reagan books that are pretty crazy well, signs across a washington autograph over the weekend really is it real it's authenticated but what's I, it on it was a letter written to somebody else that he had it but i'll show you later wow um but there's a lot of presidential stuff and in there is a signed MAGA hat. And next to it is Al Gore's signed Inconvenient Truth, which right is in the really, same case. This really so rare. Funny. And yeah. there's an Obama uh, signed book. There's, um, I also think in that case, there is a Michelle Obama signed book, maybe? I'm not sure. I don't know if it's in the same case, but it's up there. All next to each other. Yeah. So how would you, if I have a, an Al Gore, like the liberal of liberal, if I have an Al Gore book next to a MAGA hat, how do you assume that I am one more than the other? Because the marketing for the MAGA hat is so polarizing that just the fact that I would have it, you would assume that I would be for Trump. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Not taking into consideration that it's a presidential display. I have Lyndon Johnson playing cards from Air Force One. Is that less presidential or more presidential than a MAGA? Like, I don't... Ronald Reagan... Ronald Reagan started to make America great again. That isn't Trump. He's not original to that. That's funny, isn't it? Yeah, so the the funniest thing is is that the way that you talk about presidents in general is a case study kind of approach and everyone puts their kind of beliefs into whatever you're saying. Yeah. And so because the MAGA hat is so polarizing, the assumption is that nobody would have that if they weren't for that, which is absolutely not the truth. You don't understand me whatsoever if you're making that conclusion. And also, in a sense, I do feel like everybody's so polarized, they they lose sight a little bit of how crazy cool it is that 
that's president. Like those things have been touched by a president, like who is a it's king been less than 50. It's a king. Yeah. Uh, there's this book called uh, the president's club and it kind of at the beginning, it says uh, George Washington designed it to be your king with an expiration date, but they are our king for, right. for four years or eight years or whatever it is. That to me is, is more interesting than the, whatever the MAGA hat means to the people that hate it or the people that love it. To me, it's incredible marketing on the back of Ronald Reagan and most people don't even get that that's a Ronald Reagan thing. It's not even a Trump thing. But you'd have to be into the history of that too. Yeah, it's a case study. But I also have a Shepard Fairey uh, print that he did that says it's morning again in America with Ronald Reagan. And the morning is, is felt like that's morning a death, not... Yeah. That's funny. But does that make me anti-Reagan? No. No. But people assume. Yeah. It's it's fun to watch. And hence why I feel like I never fit in because people don't get – people are looking for the easy – they're looking for small talk to jump to a conclusion. And I really – I want to have a real conversation. Yeah. I'm not into small talk. I hate small talk. Yeah. I think that you're – people are looking to put you in a box and you're looking to download more data like research data. It's a case study. And it's the best way I can describe People have been it. trying to put me in a box since day one. So I uh, find it entertaining, but it doesn't put me in a box. Yeah. But you, the f uh, it doesn't hurt me that people think that I'm pro Trump. Yeah. I like that. You, you never try to correct anybody on anything that they say for the most part. Yeah. You know why that is? I don't know because it's not gonna how they feel about you doesn't affect you. Is that part of it at all? Well, are there good things about Trump? Sure. Are there bad things about Trump? Definitely. Yeah. So, I do I have to be all in on somebody like that? Like, it, what what's what happens is the people that are pro Trump aren't willing to talk about the truth of what he is and the people that are anti aren't willing to talk about the great things that he did. Yeah. And so you're, you there's, it's a, it's a no starter because once somebody tells you their side, they uh, it's very hard to get them to do anything, but talk about their side. That's kind of, um, it doesn't feel like we vote for the person anymore. We just pick a team and then it, Whoever, or, I, I vote yeah, blue, I vote red or whatever. And I, I'm not red or blue. I would vote for the person. And most of the time, I don't feel like the people that we're serving up are the answer. Yeah, they're just. Uh, I think that who the red or blue side thinks is going to push their agenda the most. Like individuality yeah. is a bad thing. Almost like what we're talking about, right? Whoever complies and goes along with the script. But you have right. to. You have to love or hate Trump. You have to love or hate. But you can't. You have to love or hate Obama. They're, but the truth is they have good and bad. That's right. They're, uh, they're not a uh, singular in their performance. And it's a compl it's a very complicated, uh, it's a very complicated thing. Well said. That reminds me a lot of a, this isn't a joke, by the way. I know that when I say this reminds me a lot of, but, um, one of my favorite lessons that you've taught me is if you judge, you lose. Yeah. And maybe that's kind of a, one of the best lessons from a leadership perspective is, is that if you're going to learn all this stuff about leadership, don't judge it. That's a chase, chaseism, chase Hughes. Um, well, did I learn that from him first or no, I think I learned it from you first, but it's, it's him. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I'm, I haven't shown the leadership, uh, book to anybody who didn't, start to get sucked in like the delivery and the design of it is for more of an experience than reading a book cover to cover sort of thing so i'm excited to uh to start to see 
the conversations that it starts. I like that it physically exists now. It's kind of fun. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of, that's kind of my take on leadership and I don't know. It's not for the faint of heart, I guess. It's not a, it's not a, uh, you know, the 32 rules of leadership, you know, this and that, those are mostly management rules. Right. Leadership is something completely different. Something that it, you can't put into words or explain that can only be measured in the actions of others. And in the amazing times we're living in right now, that's not more important of a skill for us to get better at. I agree. The timing's I, perfect. The goal for us is to create some young leaders. Much needed. That, Everyone would agree with that. That focus on the truth, not the the dog whistles on both sides. That's right. Good. Well, thanks for hanging out with us. Um, the We'll keep you guys posted on the book and when it's coming out and all that. I'm thinking probably April. Can't wait. And we'll see you next time on Service Drive Revolution. Thanks so much for watching this episode of Service Job Revolution. We're uploading new stuff every day, so make sure you subscribe and click the bell icon so you don't miss out. If you have a question you'd like us to answer on the show, call 8333-ASK-SDR and we'll answer your question on the show. That's 8333-ASK-SDR. For special deals on our books and training, head over to offers.com chriscollinsinc.com. Now that's offers.chriscollinsinc.com. I'm Chris Collins and I'll see you in the next video.